Okay, all I can say is I'm sitting here for this entire service, filling so much I can barely control it. Do you realize that you were led tonight in prayer by our next cantor and our next assistant rabbi? And what a beautiful service. And Joyce, you and me, we're just here. You know, it's just, here we are. We're just, but how beautiful was that? And I'm just felling seeing these young people who are poised to become the leaders in the Jewish people, starting their careers here at CBST, having so much to teach us and so much from which we grow. And just seeing the two of you up here, I was just bursting, just bursting, bursting, bursting with so much happiness and joy. So thank the two of you. And Joyce, we'll just keep plugging along. <laughs> and so beautiful, really. What a gorgeous, gorgeous service. And um, I keep saying this in every possible moment I can, because for those of us who are not in this moment, it's hard to appreciate that for both of these young people who are about to be ordained as cantor and rabbi, this is a very, very holy, holy moment. It's a culmination of a lifetime of years of study, and it's about really stepping over a very important moment to the rest of their lives. And what an honor it is for us that the two of you have chosen to be with us as you move into this next stage of your life and of your teaching and of your cantorate and your rabbinate. We are so grateful to the two of you and look forward to learning and davening and laughing and crying with you for a long time to come. So, wow, tonight was really mwah, a, taste of, a taste of the future in such a beautiful, beautiful way. So thank you, thank you. So I'm very moved by the service tonight. One of the themes of my return from sabbatical has been listening and witnessing and absorbing the pain that people are in. Let's face it, the world is in a great deal of pain, our synagogue is in a lot of pain, our congregants are in a lot of pain, our staff is in a lot of pain, our board is in a lot of pain. There's a lot of pain in the world right now. And I want to say I'm here to witness it, to hold it. I honestly have no wisdom about solving it right now. I don't know if we're at the beginning of the beginning of this plague we're in, if we're at the beginning of the end, if we're at the end of the beginning, or the beginning of the middle, or the beginning of the end. Who knows? We have no idea, even two years into it. We do not know. I do know that a lot of us and a lot of our congregation is in pain. And a lot of people feel loneliness and isolation. And I want, and I've heard from a lot of different people that they feel that CBST has failed them during this pandemic. And I want to say as senior rabbi of CBST, if that is true for you in the course of this pandemic, I am publicly apologizing and I want to hear from you. I want to be part of the conversations. We are in the middle of something that is really an unknown and we have to get through it together. So please know, rabbi at cbst.org, really easy email to remember. Let me know if you want to talk. If there's something on your mind, if there's something you want me to hear about what your life has been like in this time, if there are ways that you feel that I personally or CBST collectively have failed you, let me know about that. I'm not sure I have any answers, but I'm here to witness the pain, to be, to walk alongside of all of us because I don't know. Here we are. Let's, let's, let's move through it together with love and respect, with light and with kindness. <sighs> More about that as the weeks unfold, believe me. But this, as was beautifully pointed out by our service leaders tonight, is the beginning of the eighth night of Pesach. Um, that's true for us in the diaspora and for those who are not as affiliated formally with the reform movement. The reform movement here in diaspora and increasing numbers of reconstructionists and conservative Jews as well, but certainly all the Jews in Israel, only celebrate seven days of Pesach. And the seventh day of Pesach is a very significant day. Oh, I, I have to say one other thing. Rabbi David Steinberg, how fantastic is it to see you here? Let me pause on the drosh. Let's acknowledge. So for those of you who don't know Rabbi David Steinberg, you were the, you were the first Cooperberg Ritmaster Rabbinical Intern in 1995, right? 94, 95. How much, somebody else do the math. Every time I try to do math from the Bema, I get corrected. So it's many years ago. 47 years ago? What did you say? 
27 years ago. So 27 years ago, David Steinberg was our first Cooper Berg Rittmaster Rabbinical intern, and he's gone on, what? He benched Gomel when you lost your arm. See that? The deep connections are made, and he's now the rabbi of a congregation in Duluth, Minnesota, and we're thrilled to see you here. And David is from the generation that knew Irving Cooperberg very well. You stayed at his house. You knew him very, very well 27 years ago. And now here you are at the moment where the current Cooperberg Rittmaster Rabbinical Intern is about to become our assistant rabbi. So, so beautiful to have you here tonight. So happy that you're here. So the seventh day of Pesach, what does that signify? We talk about the Chag Ha'aviv, the holiday of spring, which is one of the important themes of Pesach. And like many Jewish holidays, there's always a historical and an agricultural element to them. Something related to the earth and the cycle of the, of the earth and something related to the history of our people. So the historical piece is the Zman Cherutenu, the time of our freedom, of our liberation from Mitzrayim. So we're told according to tradition, I'm not gonna argue whether this is historically accurate, I don't really even care, but according to our tradition, on the 15th of Nisan, the Jewish people, or we call them the Israelites from that period, because Judaism didn't yet technically exist, left Mitzrayim. That was the 15th of Nisan. That's what we observe on the first night of Pesach. That's a full moon. Everybody, this year was a glorious and beautiful full moon, if you noticed. The 15th of Pesach. On the third day, Pharaoh changed his mind. On the 18th of Pesach, of Nisan, not, did I say the 15th of Pesach? The 15th of Nisan. Uh, so on the 18th of Nisan, Paro said, where are the Israelites? Where are my slaves? That was a bad idea. And sends his armies out to catch up to the Israelites who have three days ahead of them. So they catch up as we know the story and what happens? They're at the sea and the Israelites are there with the sea on the one side, potential drowning of course, and the army coming at them, the army of the most powerful military at that moment in history, coming at them with full force. That is what the seventh day represents. The seventh day of Pesach is the moment that the Israelites stepped into the sea, and we have what we call Kriyat Yamsuf, the separating of the Red Sea, of the Sea of Reeds, and the Israelite, the Jews, walk through safely, achieve freedom by reaching the other side, and the enemy is defeated. That's the seventh day of Pesach. So in Jewish life, the seventh day, which was today, the day for, it depends if you're a Reformed Jew, an Orthodox Jew, you live in Israel, you live in New York, but for us in New York who observe two days Yantiv, <laughs> the seventh day was today, and a special reading is done in, the, in, the, in Shul this morning, and it is the reading of Beshalach, of the Song of the Sea, Shiratayam, because we are celebrating this morning, it's, it took place in the morning, by the way, that the sea parted and we got through and we achieved safety, even though there was nothing that indicated to us that there was a way out, right? You got the water on one side, the army on the other side, empirically people, we're done, right? We're toast. There is no solution there. There's no, nothing that we can see with our eyes to tell us that there is a solution to this disaster. On the seventh day of Pesach, Kriyat Yamsuf, we have this miracle, and the Mepharshim, the commentators, write many different seas of Talmud about this moment, the seventh day of Pesach. So traditionally, uh, it's very famously described, there could have been, or there were, among the Israelites, four responses to this moment of complete despair. The moment when the, you, you see the Egyptians on the horizon and you, the waters behind you. So there are four responses, and I'm just going to read them quickly. There are typically four responses that the Mepharshim identify. First is, let's just jump into the sea and drown. Better that we should die than get killed by the Egyptians. It, we're not going to achieve freedom, but at least the Egyptians won't get us. Two. Let's just give up and go back to Egypt right now. This, this was an unsuccessful, we've lost, there is no hope, let's give up and go back. Three, 
let's fight the Egyptians, let's wage war, even though we have no weapons, we have, right, these are enslaved people who were free, were just left slavery a week ago, but let's just fight the Egyptians, better to die fighting than not at all, and four, let's just pray, cry out to God. Those are, the Mepharshim say, those are the four uh, possible responses. These four factions of the people at this moment represent, according to the Mepharshim, four classical responses to situations of total despair. The situation of the Israelites is just used by the rabbis to talk about that moment of complete hopelessness, right? The sea over here, the Egyptian army over here, it doesn't look worse than that. That's used in rabbinic literature to talk about the moment of there are no possibilities of hope. There is nothing that gives us any, any inkling that we can survive this and that we can reach the promised land. Forget it. It's over. Cut, put, done. There's no chance, right? That's a pretty good scenario. So the rabbis love discussing, well, what is the response when you are in the middle of a moment of total despair? How do you respond to the moment that a realistic person would say there is no hope? That's a realistic response, right? The, the Egyptian army here, the water here. Realism says there is no hope. So I love to quote on this the Lubavitcher Rebbe, which is his take on this, and other rabbis write about this, because this whole thing of these four responses, uh, there's a lot to say about it. I don't have the time, but this is a very big discussion in rabbinic literature about those possible four responses. The Lubavitcher Rebbe basically says, the response of a Jew in a moment of despair in which there is no seemingly obvious possibility for hope is to, to phrase something a little more contemporary, our job as Jews at that moment is to keep our eyes on the prize. To remember, Sinai is waiting for us. The whole point of this was to get out of Egypt, out of slavery, in order to create a new society. We cannot let those moments of complete despair prevent us from remembering what we know to be true. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe writes, and this is very moving to me, when a Jew is headed towards Sinai and is confronted by, hostile, by a hostile or a indifferent world, there is no choice but to go forward. That our job in those moments of complete despair is to go forward. In the Lubavitcher Rebbe's words, it's do another mitzvah. Exactly at that moment of despair, do something. Do a mitzvah. In exactly that moment of despair, light the light in another soul. Or if we could extrapolate from the Lubavitcher Rebbe's language maybe into ours, as we sit in those moments of our life, and Lord knows we are in one right now, right? Where we feel like the Egyptian army is over there and the water is over here. And what sane, realistic person would say there's possibility of a future spring? Our job, our tradition tells us, is to look forward toward the Sinai, toward the reality that we know exists even if nobody can see it. And we have to keep bringing the light. We, each of us, we have to make sure we're taking care of the light that's in every single person around us and doing all we can to keep that light lit. We have to keep going through that sea, that yamsuf, and understanding it's a miracle, but that miracle only happens if we keep moving forward. The Yamsuf, we are told, parts only when the first person moved forward. That is the miracle of humanity, is to hope, is to see something that's not realistic. But we understand we're looking at Mount Sinai. We're keeping our eye on the prize. And we have to believe in the possibilities of a world that exists that no one can tell us they've seen before. That's the power, not just of faith in God, which I believe deeply in, but the faith in each of us as human beings and the power of us doing this together. When we feel like we are in that moment of despair, 
and the Egyptian army is on one side and the water to drown in is on the other side, we sing the song of the sea and we move forward. And Miriam then takes her timbrel in her hand and we create art and we create beauty and we sing and we dance. Az Yashir, this is the song of the Jews at the sea. <laughs> <laughs> 